Okay, so we are in Chapter 14, Late Adulthood, Body and Mind. So one of the problems with this age is ageism, which is actually a form of prejudice. When you look at somebody old and you just kind of judge them based on the fact that they're old, you kind of make assumptions and you consider them as part of the elderly category. You don't look at them as individuals. Part of the problem is that this kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because it kind of comes true because people believe it. People have a tendency to think that all elderly people can't do things. So when you see videos on Facebook of, you know, the 90-year-old lady who is still dancing, you're like surprised and shocked that how can somebody old do that? But the bottom line is that they are individuals and should be judged as such. They shouldn't be considered part of the category of elderly people. They should be considered as individuals. Elder speak is the condescending way people have a tendency to talk to older adults. It kind of resembles baby talk that we talked about way back in like chapter two. But people have a tendency to talk really loud. They talk in a higher voice, talk slower, exaggerate certain things, repeat themselves constantly talk in short sentences and you know like when you talk to babies when you're talking to an elderly person you may kind of be like oh my gosh so how was your day that kind of thing um but you get a really high pitch you don't speak to them normally and the problem is that when you talk to them like that it kind of reinforces ageism and kind of reinforces that you think that they need to be spoken to in this particular way. Some people may talk louder than normal, you know, and you assume kind of because they're old, they can't hear you. And that's just not the case. So what we see is that we have two consequences going on here. Elderly people have a tendency to all be treated as frail. They're all confused. And that's, like I said, not the case. They actually may become more dependent on others because, as I said earlier, it kind of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So they may even start to believe it's true. And also, we have norms for young that kind of apply to everyone. So you may try and fix the old people and may kind of you know, try and help them too much to the extent that if they try to do something on their own and they fail, they may just give up entirely. So ageism can actually impair daily life because oftentimes it prevents depressed older people from getting help because they kind of just accept that they're old, their life's almost at the end, and, you know, what's the point kind of thing. So the problem is that when older people contribute their problems to their age, they just don't get help for them. And that can really become an issue. They don't try to change their situation. They don't try to work on themselves. They kind of start joking about it. And if they forget something, they refer to it as a senior moment. And like I said, sometimes that's just not healthy. Even though they are older, they still need to live healthy, productive lives or as healthy as possible anyway. So they really should seek help if they are having an issue. Some younger adults and the media kind of discourage the elderly from leaving their home. And this really contributes to ageism, especially as far as driving goes. And yes, we've talked about the fact that vision goes down and hearing goes down and everything kind of goes down when you get older. But the bottom line is that a lot of elderly individuals still can hear and still can drive and get out of the house. And they should be encouraged to get out of the house. So the stereotype threat happens when elderly individuals kind of have anxiety just about the possibility that they're going to be judged as elderly people. So basically, we need to recognize that they are elderly. We need to, you know, acknowledge that they are older, their actual chronological age, without stereotyping them into a category and without ageism coming into play. 
Older people are more likely to estimate that their own functioning is actually better than the average older person. So they always say that they have better memory than the average older individual. They're faster than everybody else their age. They're really good at making friends. And the reality is that how a person thinks of their old age actually can affect their recovery from major illnesses. We kind of started talking about your attitude plays an important role. And a positive attitude can help you recover from illnesses. This goes for younger and older people. But earlier attitudes can contribute to kind of what they think and what they feel. So we need to try to keep elderly individuals kind of positive. And yes, they are older. Yes, it is, you know, coming to their end of their life. They're in the last portion of it. But they still need to live. They still need to have a good time. They still need to have a life. In general, <clears throat> the reality is only 10% of people over the age of 65 see well without glasses. So, yes, we've kind of talked about the deficits that elderly individuals have. So that does prevent them from doing things, but they still can be encouraged to go out with other individuals. Younger individuals can take them places um, so that they don't become hermits. And we don't want them depending on you. So try to encourage them to do as much as they can, as much as they're able to. You know, you don't want to send them to Walmart if they can't see, but you want to go with them and get them out of the house. Visually speaking, cataracts are a problem. Cataracts are when the lens of your eye becomes really thick and it causes your vision to become cloudy so you can't see. Cataract surgery is the basic equivalent of LASIK surgery. So... Individuals used to use cataract surgery as an excuse to have LASIK surgery. I don't think you can do that anymore, but it happens as you get older. That's the bottom line. The lens loses the elasticity that it once had, so it can't accommodate your vision as well as it used to. So now you need glasses and possibly you can get cataracts. Glaucoma happens when we have fluid in our eyes. And when that fluid builds up, it causes pressure in your eyes and can actually compress and damage the optic nerve. A lot of times headaches are often felt with glaucoma. And yes, medical marijuana is the treatment for glaucoma, but it's treating the symptoms, not treating the actual problem. Macular degeneration is when the retina starts to deteriorate. And basically what happens is individuals that suffer from this have donut vision, so they can only see around the center of their field of vision. So if somebody has this condition, oftentimes they will be speaking to you, but kind of looking off to the side because that's how they can see you. They can't see you if you're looking at them head on, if they're looking at you head on. This happens with old age. It also can happen with certain conditions like kidney failure and things like that. But remember, the retina is where the images are focused in our eyes. So once that starts to kind of degenerate and degrade and deterioration starts to occur, a lot of other problems can start to happen as well. So this is just showing you vision with different eyes. So normal vision, and then you have cataract vision, which is cloudy, of course. And then glaucoma with the pressure building up. And the last slide there, D, is macular degeneration. So as I said, they can see around the center of the field of vision. Auditory problems are an issue as well. You may have necess necessity to have a hearing aid, but people still hesitate to get hearing aids because in the past they were really bulky and you could see, you know, from a mile away that you had a hearing aid. So it was kind of about embarrassment. But now they have smaller ones. They have more sensitive ones. And the joke kind of always is with older people that they'll turn down their hearing aids if they don't want to listen to you. But those individuals that say those kind of things actually are kind of well adjusted. They acknowledge that they're older and need help. Sometimes they'll miss out on bits of conversation, and this is going to cut down on communication, and they're not going to want to go out anymore. 
So if you know anybody who is elderly and they do need a hearing aid, you want to encourage them to get one because it's not embarrassing and it shouldn't have a stigma attached to it. They're older. They need help sometimes. That's all it is to it. So you want them to still be able to communicate effectively and go out into social settings and not, you know, be left out. Disability advocates actually seek what's called universal design which this is the creation of equipment and settings that can actually be used by everyone. So whether they're able-bodied, whether their senses have deficits, because everything is kind of designed for young adults without impairments at all. I mean, if you think about it, houses, shoes, pill bottles, um, print, now they're actually starting to have more large print books and things available for individuals who can't see as well. So that's a good thing. But a lot of disability advocates say that everything should kind of be designed universally so that whether you have a deficit or not, you can still use everything. It's always important to stay healthy and get enough sleep. As you get older, you do not need as much sleep, but Older adults have a tendency to spend more time in bed. They take longer to fall asleep and wake up more often. Elders usually feel less tired than young adults when they're on their own schedule, as opposed to, you know, somebody saying, you have to go to bed at this time, you have to wake up at this time. We all have our natural circadian rhythms, remember? And those start to diminish with age. So you don't have a set schedule as much as you do when you're younger. Older adults are more likely to take naps, and it's all normal. Part of the problem of ageism is actually you kind of expect older individuals to fall asleep like younger individuals can, and that can cause distress in older adults. You know, if you tell them you have to go to bed at this time, you have to wake up at this time, and you don't let them have their own schedule, that can be a problem, and that can cause stress, which we all know stress causes health issues. And that could also cause them to have sleep issues. Older people exercise less than younger adults do. And it's really not about, you know, doing cardio or dancing or anything like that. Older individuals need to move because movement of any kind is better than sitting still. And regular movement or exercise can actually extend your life. So we need to get older adults walking a little more just doing what they can do within their limits, but they need to do something. You can accommodate their disabilities as needed, but they can still get some kind of exercise, some kind of movement, even if they can't walk as well, you know, work out their hands, their arms, things like that. So just think about things that they can do. And remember that ageism is a huge problem. I always go back to that commercial where they have the older individuals, I've fallen and I can't get up to try and sell their life alert bracelets or whatever they are. We can't keep perpetuating this theme that just because they're older, you know, they've fallen down and are, they can't get up. Some younger adults that have back issues like me, if I fall down, I have a heck of a time getting up. So it's not just elderly individuals. And again, not all elderly individuals fall into these categories. So we really have to be careful with what our commercials are saying and what they're kind of, you know, the stereotypes that they're kind of per perpetrating. We don't want them to continue on and we don't want to make elderly individuals feel worse, you know, than, is, than they do. They already don't feel as healthy as they did when they're younger they already have to accept the fact that they're, you know, in the last portion of their life and they have so many things to deal with. We really don't need to add to it. This is just showing you that um, in 2011, these are the age groups that met the guidelines for aerobic activity or met the guidelines for muscle strengthening activities. So 18 to 44, of course, is the most, but when you look at 65 and over, less than 40%, so about 35% met the aerobic guidelines and about 15% the muscle strengthening guidelines. Those are not strong numbers. We already know that activity of any kind is going to be good. So 
you know, they don't have to necessarily go to health clubs or anything like that. Try to get them outside walking, take a walk around the block even. And again, anything is going to be better than nothing. A lot of our organs rely on these activities. And the stronger our organs are, there's actually a correlation with memory, intelligence, and happiness in general. So the healthier you feel, the healthier you are, the healthier you think, the healthier the whole person is going to be. The demographic shift refers to the shift in the proportions of the populations of various ages. Demography is just the study of populations. So you look at different populations and describe them in terms of age. So in 2015, the ratio of children to older people was about three to one. They hypothesized in 2075, it's actually going to be equal. It's going to be one to one. So we're kind of shifting towards we're having more older people and fewer younger people. We have three reasons for a traditional pyramidal shape, which, you know, is just more younger people than older people. Far more children were born than the replacement rate, so more births than deaths in a nutshell. Before modern sanitation and nutrition, about half of the children died before age five. So now children in general are surviving, so they're getting older. Middle-aged people rarely survive adult diseases like cancer and heart attacks, as opposed to if younger people had them. So we have this shift happening where our population is starting to get older. So if you were to have a square, some industrialized nations already do not have the perfect pyramid shape and are almost square. So that means that it's either a stable population and it's going to turn into a decreasing population. Because if you have an even amount of every group, so pre-reproductive, reproductive, and post-reproductive, if you have even amounts of all of those and you're not replacing and having more children, you know, that population is going to start getting older and that population is going to eventually start decreasing. So a lot of nations are actually kind of heading towards this. So it tells you that we are starting to actually age. <laughs> Our population is becoming older. India 2011, this was the demographic pyramid. So as you can see, it's kind of like a pyramid shape. So a lot of younger individuals, pre-reproductive years, some post-reproductive years, and then a few older individuals. But this is an increasing population. It's a healthy population. Again, you don't want to increase ridiculously, but you don't want to be decreasing either. Japan, it's not yet square, but a lot of older individuals, not as many pre-reproductive individuals. So this population is going to start heading towards the square and will eventually start decreasing. <clears throat> so we have some theories of aging. The wear and tear theory is basically just you use it, it gets old, it wears out. Your body kind of suffers from overuse harmful foods, pollution, radiation, everything that we're kind of subjected to. The theory was actually discounted by evidence from calorie restriction because if everything slows down as you age, your digestion and metabolism slows down. So if you restrict your calories, Theoretically speaking, it should slow the aging process because your digestive system doesn't have to work so hard. Your metabolism doesn't have to be so high because you're not taking in as many calories. But what actually happened was it increased. So when people restricted their calorie intake, aging actually kind of sped up almost. The next one is the genetic theory. That basically just says we all have a genetic clock. It kind of gets hormonal changes, things die. Basically, every species has a maximum lifespan. It's different from the average life expectancy, though. 
Average life expectancy is how old the average individual is expected to live. The genetic theory talks about every species having a maximum lifespan. And then that species in general is going to die once they hit that maximum lifespan if they live that long. So let's say humans. We'll say humans have a 90-year maximum lifespan. If that was the case, we wouldn't have individuals that are older than 90. But we do. So we're not talking about average life expectancy. We're talking about maximum lifespan. Um, the average life expectancy has actually doubled in the last century, more than doubled in the last century. So we're kind of thinking that life expectancy is getting older and the maximum lifespan could be kind of heading towards increase. The last theory is the cellular aging theory. This theory kind of focuses on how molecules and cells are affected by aging. The Hayflick limit is basically the number of times a cell can divide, and research shows that that's about 50 times. Telomeres are on the ends of our chromosomes. They're actually the ends of our chromosomes. And what happens is every time our cells divide, those telomeres kind of get shorter and shorter. So every time our cells go through cell division, you're losing telomeres. The theory is that at some point you start losing important genes on those telomeres and you just start aging. An interesting thing about this is that cancer cells actually release an enzyme called telomerase, which prevents those ends from being lost. So cancer cells can divide on and on and on and, you know, to infinity because they produce that telomerase. So that's kind of an interesting thing. We also know that women outlive men, and we know that women's telomeres are actually longer than men's. So they're still really researching these theories to figure out why we age. And there's actually a lot of money going into trying to stop the aging process. You've probably seen advertisements for different creams and everything else to try to get rid of wrinkles and try and stop the inevitable from happening. But the bottom line is that everything has its time. Everything is going to age. Everything is going to pass at some point in time. So spending billions of dollars to fight that, is there really a benefit from that? Because then you have to also think, let's say we do crack the code. Let's say that everybody can live forever. Everybody is now immortal. What's going to happen to the space on the planet? Are we going to say that everybody is immortal, but you can no longer have children? Because if you can, then we're going to have more people being added to the earth. And bottom line is the earth is only so big. We can only hold so many people. So what's going to happen from there? So research on theories and um, aging, basically, have not yet found a way to postpone death. So the problem becomes more funding for anti-aging research and less for specific diseases because that would reduce our health care costs. Or do we think anti-aging research is foolish and unethical? So I want you guys to think about that because that's something we're going to talk about in class. And um, I want to get your opinions. More funding for anti-aging research or are we wasting our money? So it kind of brings up what I pointed out with, you know, if everybody becomes immortal, can we not have kids anymore? Or are we just going to keep adding people to the planet? So think about that. Once again, we go to selective optimization with compensation. So when older adults, you know, have to compensate for certain things, older adults who consider their health good, which actually was most of them, were asked whether they had sexual intercourse within the past year. And if they answered yes, they were considered sexually active. So intercourse within the last year, at least once, was considered sexually active for them. 
the good thing about this is it offers a way for them to kind of cope with senescence and cope with the whole aging process without giving into ageism, without thinking that they belong in this category that they can no longer have sex. You know, they shouldn't be having sex because they're too old. Sexual satisfaction actually kind of usually increases with age. So when they do have it, you know, they're usually satisfied. So the question becomes, should older couples have more sex? That depends on the person in a nutshell. So sexual needs and interactions vary a lot from one person to another. Some older individuals are fine with kissing and hugging. Some older individuals are fine with no intimate contact whatsoever. But research has shown that kissing and hugging actually predicted happiness in longer lasting couples, not intercourse. So couples that were together for a long time still kissed and hugged more and sex wasn't really important to them. Yes, they still had sex, but it wasn't really important. Sexual activity is actually more of a social construct than a biological event. So they kind of compensate for the physical changes by optimizing their relationship in other ways, which is a good thing. So intimacy is really where the key is here. Driving, of course, with age, driving gets more difficult. Reading road signs takes longer. Turning their heads become harder. Reaction time slows. We already know that reaction time slows as you get older. Your night vision worsens. The elderly people usually hate to give up driving because they feel like they've lost their freedom. If they can no longer drive themselves to the store, now they're kind of stuck and they have to rely on other people. So it's a very difficult thing for them to deal with. To compensate, sometimes they may drive slow, not drive at night, um, you know, that kind of thing. We have society-wide initiatives with changes in driver's license renewal. They have to actually go in person and take tests and simulating driving tests. The crash rate is actually low because they limit themselves. So they won't drive at night, they won't drive when it's raining, they won't drive in the snow, they won't drive in the fog, that kind of thing. So crashes aren't really an issue with elderly individuals because of the fact that they compensate by limiting themselves. <clears throat> Medical compensation, we have primary, secondary aging, and compression of morbidity. Primary aging happens to all of us. It is a universal construct. Secondary aging, however, has a lot to do with genetics, your habits, and your environment. So primary aging is going to happen to everyone. Secondary aging happens if, like, you smoke or you're an alcoholic, you're a heavy drinker, if you live in polluted areas, that kind of thing. And compression of morbidity happens when you stay as active for as long as possible so that you actually have fewer years of disability before death. So, you know, you stay active as long as you possibly can so that you're not disabled in your older years, so that you're not trapped in your house, reliant on others, that kind of thing. So you're living a healthier life in general. Medical research has actually discovered that personal habits, therapies, surgeries that reduce frailty are out there for almost every disease, every condition. So we can basically kind of fix almost anything in a nutshell, except aging. We can't fix aging. So as I said, compression of morbidity is the shortening the time that the person spends ill or infirm, which is basically ill before death. This is accomplished by postponing illnesses. So the longer you can stay active, the longer you can stay healthy, if you take your medicine, if you get the hearing aids, that kind of thing. So due to improvements in lifestyle, so they may eat healthier, they may exercise more often. As I said, medicine, take their medicine and technological aids that help them stay healthier and active is really the key. 
then they can recover faster from illnesses and they're not going to be debilitated by illness. <clears throat> WHO, which is the World Health Organization, and a lot of experts posit that disability is the result of the person and environment interaction. So environmental change actually limits disability. Heart disease, your heart becomes less elastic, less flexible, which is going to increase your blood pressure over time as far as primary aging goes. So that happens to everybody. Secondary aging, if you smoke or you're obese, that's going to increase your chances of heart disease or if you do not eat healthy, that kind of thing. Osteoporosis, it's been found that underweight women, their bones are more porous. So simple falls can actually break bones. Osteoclasts are the cells that we have that break down bone and osteoblasts are the cells that we have that build up bone. So a lot of times osteoclasts will break down bone faster than osteoblasts will put down new bone. And if osteoclasts outpace the osteoblasts, you're going to have porous bones. Your bones will be able to break easier. Weight bearing and muscle strengthening exercises can help this. So if you know any older women, because women are more likely to suffer from osteoporosis than men in general, try to encourage them to stay active. As everything else, our brain ages as well. The production of neurotransmitters is going to be slowed down, so everything's going to take longer. Thinking will take longer. Processing things will take longer. The neurofluid and gray matter decreases, so your cell bodies and your unmelanated axons are going to start to decrease. Your myelinated axons, the myelination is going to start to thin, so impulses are not going to be sent as fast and they're not going to travel as fast. Cerebral blood circulates more slowly, which is the blood to the brain. So everything's going to kind of slow down in your brain. Sometimes white matter lesions are thought to result from impairments in blood flow. So your cerebral blood circulation will not be as effective, as efficient, and it could cause these lesions. This is going to increase the time it takes to process a thought. However, medicine can help with certain things. A uh, society that makes medicines available, of course, can help with certain things. And then the individual who takes their medicine can help with certain things. So medicine can help, but first the medicine has to be available, and then the person has to take the medicine. So we really need to pay attention to elderly individuals that we know. And as you get older, you need to, you know, make conscious decisions and think about your health, not only now, but think about your health down the road. New neurons form and dendrites do grow in adulthood, but only in the olfactory region and the hippocampus. The olfactory region is how we smell, of course, and the hippocampus is remembering. Old neurons can develop new dendrites, though. So we can make new connections. We can learn new things. We can remember new things. But the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex do shrink in older age. So that's why they say to try to keep your brain active. So do crossword puzzles, play games, do that kind of thing. Just keep your brain active as you get older. Compensation occurs when older adults use more parts of their brain to solve problems. So they kind of get the, you know, all parts of their brain involved instead of localizing it. The Flynn effect is the effect that we have seen where every generation is has a higher intellect, a higher IQ than the previous generation. And that goes for all ages across the board and all nations. So we know that intellectual ability is there. We just have to kind of resist depression, resist anxiety, and 
keep using our brain in a nutshell. This is a, these are pictures of images of the brains of healthy 65 to 70 year olds. The images show normal brain loss, which are the white areas from the lowest percentile to the highest percentile. So starting at the lowest, there's minimal brain loss going over to the highest where there's quite a bit of brain loss. Some atrophy is inevitable. It's always going to happen. Even some younger brains start to atrophy, but few elders are average. So you're going to have kind of at the higher end of this atrophy occurring. Some information actually never reaches the sensory memory in older people because our senses get weaker, so they do not detect the stimuli. Our senses slow down and start to get weaker as we age, it's a fact. The brain kind of fills in what we miss though. Our brains are pretty impressive at filling in missed information. Elderly people's underlying problem with sensory input can be in the brain because as we just talked about, brains atrophy as we get older, but it can also be with the senses, just normal aging on the senses, slowing them down, or it could actually be a problem with both. The stereotype threat, again, if an older person thinks that their memories are failing, they start to get really anxious. Oh my gosh, I'm getting Alzheimer's. Oh my gosh, I'm in dementia. But that anxiety can actually impair their memory. So it's kind of like um, when you get stressed, a lot of younger individuals may get stressed because they think they're pregnant. Well, the problem is that stress delays their period even more. So this is the same thing. They forget things and so they get anxious because they think they're hitting dementia or Alzheimer's. So that makes it even worse. So the problem is to make sure that they know that just because they forget things here and again, it doesn't mean that, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia is kicking in. We do have source amnesia, which is forgetting the origin of a fact, idea, or conversation. So you kind of forget something. And that really happens to everybody, but it happens more often in older individuals. Prospective memory is trying to remember that you have to do something in the future. So I have to go to the doctor tomorrow. So you may forget that you have to go to the doctor tomorrow. And again, that can happen no matter what. It doesn't mean that Alzheimer's or dementia is kicking in. So our brain slowdown reduces working memory because older adults take longer to perceive and process sensations. So they, you know, may forget names or they may forget numbers and that's perfectly normal. It becomes a problem if they forget like where they were born or forget their family or forget big things that they've known their whole lives. That means that it's pathological, something's wrong. We do have reduced working memory and that's gonna inhibit multitasking, but again, this is normal. Your brain slowing down as you get older, so your working memory is going to be hindered. Normal. It doesn't mean that Alzheimer's or dementia is kicking in. Now, if the older individual forgets where they were born, that could be a problem. Part of the information processing system consists of methods to regulate the flow of information and how we analyze information. Again, the prefrontal cortex is involved. And we already know that the prefrontal cortex starts to shrink as you get older. Useful control processes are memory and retrieval strategies. So again, make sure that you're using your brain. Use information, you know, try to remember information, things like that. Selective attention, make sure you're focusing on a particular thing that's important, ignoring the things that aren't important. And we can use rules and strategies for problem solving. So, you know, remember, you know, like I tell my biology students to remember the domain order, you know, do kings play chess on fuzzy green stools? So domain, kingdom, all that stuff. So, you know, it's a way to remember things. It's a way to solve a problem. It's a strategy. 
Control processes do become less effective with age, though, simply because our brain is slowing down, our cortex, prefrontal cortex is shrinking. But they help. So in daily life, output is usually verbal. Output on cognitive tests may not actually reflect the ability. Ecological validity is cognition, is the fact that cognition should be measured in a natural setting and the abilities measured should be what they need in real life. So, you know, solving a standardized test now is no longer important. We should test things that they need. So see if they can still tie their shoes, see if they know how to cook a meal and measure these things at their home, you know, in their neighborhood, that kind of thing. The rate of neurocognitive disorders increases with every decade once you hit 60. Again, ageism and ageist terms kind of distort and exaggerate this. It's one of those things where you see somebody who's 65, oh, they must be retired, they must have Alzheimer's. And that's just not the case. The DSM-4 does have criteria that need to be met for dementia and senility. And the DSM-5 says it has to be a major or mild cognitive impairment. So again, it has to be significant, not just one time. It has to be all the time. It has to be with major information like your birthday, that kind of stuff. They can do biomarkers and brain scans to see if you are predisposed to um, these disorders. And they can also do them to see if you are currently experiencing these disorders. Prevalence of these disorders after age 70. So if you look between 70 and 80, it increases significantly, 80 to 90, even higher. But look at the percentages. Even at the highest, 90 plus, it's only 36%. 37% of all these individuals. So not everyone gets it. Most elderly people do not even experience a neurocognitive disorder. Among people in their 70s, only one in 20 does. Most of those who reach the age of 90 to 100 do not really lose their cognitive abilities. So it's not as we assume. Ageism is really bad with this. We just assume because they're older, it's an issue, but it's not always an issue. Most of the time, it's not an issue. Alzheimer's is now referred to as a major neurocognitive disorder. It's characterized by gradual deterioration of memory and personality. The problem with Alzheimer's disease is that the only definitive diagnosis is at autopsy because these beta amyloid plaques of protein gather and form in the brain and you have tangles of the tau protein. So you can dissect the brain, see these plaques, see these tangles, and you can say definitively they have Alzheimer's. We do have treatment, treatments available and drugs that they're trying out to treat Alzheimer's. So they're basically kind of looking at the symptoms and saying, well, let's try this. I've heard conflicting, you know, they help, they don't help. So, you know, I guess it just depends on the individual. They can be modified by education, so using that cognitive reserve, as I said, keep your mind, um, even, you, use your mind, use your brain, keep your, think, you know, do puzzles, do play games, that kind of thing. Make sure, active, that's what I was looking for. Keep your mind active. It is partly genetic, though. Trisomy 21 or one of three genes can impact and you can have Alzheimer's if you hit middle age. Later life onset has some genetic impact, but um, the genes involved can be different. So Alzheimer's in middle age is rare. Again, usually caused by genes and progresses quickly. Most of them begin much later and a lot of genes kind of add to it. The first stage is forgetfulness, especially for recent information, new events that are happening. The second stage is generalized confusion. Then we go to dangerous memory loss, impaired communication, and finally unresponsiveness. 
So again, just because somebody is forgetful, just because they're forgetting certain things, doesn't mean they're in the stages of Alzheimer's. It has to be consistent forgetfulness and they can't kind of, they can't remember, you know, recent things that happened to them. The generalized confusion then comes over where it's kind of like they're not sure where they are sometimes. And then you hit the dangerous memory loss. So just because somebody forgets that they have to go to the doctor tomorrow doesn't mean they're in early stage of Alzheimer's. Strokes can also cause issues. Um, so we have the cerebral circulation in our brains. So the blood supply to our brains, if you have an obstruction in one of those blood vessels, oxygen is not hitting to the brain. So you could have multiple strokes within a short time period. A transient ischemic attack is basically when your brain does not have oxygen and you can use tissue plasminogen activators as treatments. But again, the stroke really depends, the recovery from the stroke depends on the age of the individual, their attitude in general, their health in general, uh, where the obstruction was at, how long it was obstructed for, that kind of thing. Some people can recover completely from strokes. Other people, it's debilitating. The multi-infarct dementia is correlated with the APOE4 gene. And basically, again, it's the forgetfulness and it's kind of happening from different areas of the brain where there was blockage and these brain areas started to die. Frontal temporal neurocognitive disorders are the most common PIC disease. 15% of all U.S. NCD cases have an earlier onset. And these are different from Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's does not always lead to dementia. It starts with tremors in your muscles or you're really rigid and the neurons that produce dopamine start to degenerate. So you no longer have the dopamine supplies. Younger adults may avoid dementia for years, but older people may develop it sooner. But there's treatment with L-DOPA, which is a synthetic dopamine that, again, I've heard various reports. Some say it works wonders. Some say not so much. So I think, again, it's individualized. Lewy body disease is named after the deposits of the protein in the neuron, which are Lewy bodies. Numerous there's a lot of them. They're all over the brain. Your motor movements and cognition are impacted, but the main symptom is loss of inhibition. So these individuals will just do anything. They no longer have a filter. They no longer have that thing in their brain that says, maybe I shouldn't do this. That's all gone. So how do we prevent this from happening? Brain damage in general the more severe, the less there is hope of recovery. And brain damage that is severe can't be reversed, but the rate of decline and some of the treatments can be treated or some of the symptoms can be treated. So you can control how fast an individual deteriorates. Education, of course, knowing how to help control this and how to fix these things is crucial. Exercise, as I said, movement of any kind. These individuals are just sitting in a chair, stretching out their muscles, trying to get some strength in their muscles. Any kind of exercise is going to benefit. And then medication, of course. And if you have medication, take it and avoid any pathogens that might cause illness, if possible. We can treat the depression that occurs with a lot of these individuals with, of course, medication, therapy, nutrition, educate them on proper foods to eat, try to eat healthier, not any empty calories, that kind of thing. And polypharmacy can be kind of a problem because sometimes individuals have more than one medication from more than one doctor. So we have to be careful with the medications that our elderly individuals take and get prescribed. And we have to make sure that the combination that they are taking is working and doing something because otherwise there's really no point to taking them. 
Integrity is the final stage of Erickson's model in which older people gain the interest in the arts and their children and in being alive as a whole. Despair, of course, is the other side when they look back on their life and they have regrets. So we want elderly individuals to look back on their lives and know that they accomplished all they wanted to accomplish and not have any regrets. We don't want them to be depressed and say, well, I should have done this, I should have done that. Maslow's final stage, remember, is self-actualization, so becoming the wonderful you that you are. And this is basically when you have a complete understanding of yourself in all aspects of life. Generally, extraordinarily creative people think that they're ability, their goals, their quality of their work is really not impaired as they get older. So what you really need to do when you get to this stage is kind of look back on your life and look at it in perspective. You do not want to think that, well, I should have done this, I should have done different. You live the life you were supposed to lead kind of thing. Life review actually involves looking at your role in, you know, our history. So just kind of take everything into account. If you know any individuals in this stage, you know, make sure that they're taking all of this into account and they're not just getting depressed. With age comes wisdom, they always say. Expert knowledge is, as far as understanding the meaning of life, we assume that older people have a better understanding of this. We assume that older people have more wisdom. Some elderly people are really wise, like crazy, unusually wise. Others, not so much. But self-actualization and integrity are considered parts of wisdom. So once you've achieved these levels, once you've hit integrity, once you've achieved your self-understanding and self-awareness, you are considered to be wise. So that is all.